going for like a, I don't know, 30, 40-year-old teacher who's probably been there 10, 15 years, just a bit jaded maybe, and it really helped it. So ever, ever since that, I've never been writing books for like, that someone has already gone side with some saying, I'm going to try and persuade you that I've got an argument here. Um, and a lot of the time we teach you try and persuade them to actually try it out, try out an idea. Yeah. That's what I try to do. That's it. And I don't, I don't go beyond that, really, you know. Um, but thanks for your kind words anyway. I appreciate that. Well, I mean, as, as I said in my, my email, um, I think yeah. it, there's this sort of lazy sack back position where you can sort of go yeah. talk about what something is not. <laughs> I'm sure when some, you know, the, the pyramids were built, somebody said back and went, great, but it should have been 10 feet that way. Or, you know, I love it, but it's the wrong shape. I, was like, I, I'm, I don't think that's, that's those are constructive. Well, uh, well, uh, well, the thing is, like, there's a lot of people on the left to talk about, and I have a lot of sympathy with it change in the system but the system is there i've been working in schools in the system for like 35 years now and it's like you've got to you've got to change it from within you've got to change people's hearts and minds and then i mean there's already quite a lot of teacher kickback about you know certain initiatives and government policies and stuff like that but the books are called to arms to do more for people with less and then the sort of way we sort of structure it as you as you know is You've got, that's how high expectations for like all kids, really interesting dynamic curriculum, which is not in lots of schools. But then those kids who don't fit into that through like yeah. attitude, whatever ability, whatever you want to call it, let's give them something a bit different. And then those kids who from a background where, you know, something like university or going into academia is just really, not really from there. Let's give them something different as well. So, you know, that, that's, that's where I'm trying to get with it. I'm proud of the book, actually. You know, I think all the books I've written is the best book I've written. And Matt, who I wrote it with, I mean, we like bumped into each other. We were doing a training course, separate training course in a venue in London, probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago, left the same time, didn't know each other. I knew I was on the top floor, he was on the third floor, whatever, doing courses with teachers. And we bumped into each other in like the foyer. And that's just my predilection. And I said, oh, you've been doing training? Yeah, that's going for a quick pint, because we both getting trains. Had, a, had one pint, and then we sort of went from there, like, we kept in touch, and we both had an interesting social class, and he does a lot of stuff around people premium conferences, and... Um, in uh, in Scotland, it's called pro pupil equity. You know that extra money that's given to schools. Right. If you're from broadly speaking, on a free school meals kid or, or from a, from that background, and then we just like collaborate, and we probably got at least twice. You know, we've that as a really hugely edited down book. There was twice more yeah. that we could have put in there, but we tried to make it digestible. And I think I think Matt, who also edited it, has achieved that because I'm a little bit all over the place, sort of, you know, like, yeah. we're quite organised, but when it comes to writing, I'll write about something, I'll shoot off at a tangent, and he's kept me really, really well disciplined. So, um, yeah, it's really nice to write it. And it's, we've got a few, um, you know, there's real case studies in, 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 of schools there. I've, I've spoken to, I think, three head teachers' conferences now, so there's the opportunity to, to influence head teachers to try to change curriculum or try to do things differently. So that's what I wanted to achieve. It's a doing book, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's desperately needed. Um, I think uh, the same kind, of, same kind of sociological erasure is going on. Oh, let's, let's not talk about anything. Everybody's, everybody's fine. Everybody's happy. The people who work hard. Well, I you think, know, I think, I think you're, you're right in this because... As I say, I started teaching in 1989, and my degree was economics and politics, Manchester, which is where we nearly met last time, <laughs> um, and where I'm heading after this, actually. And then, um, and then I started teaching social sciences. So, you know, I taught um, A-level economics, politics, government politics, sociology, those type of subjects. 
So I was mostly a key stage four, key stage five teacher. Occasionally taught a bit of history lower down the school, that's I think in one or two of the schools. Um, but if you look at the trends over the years now, so like, I mean, do you know, like, A-level, what's the most popular A-level in England now? Ooh, yeah. I'm guessing it might be computing. It's psychology. Psychology, right. Whereas psychology is something that didn't exist when I first started teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. and, and, and what, what happened, as I was teaching, I was really, obviously, invested in social sciences doing well because that was going to be my career. There's a subject like economics got replaced with business studies. Subjects like sociology got replaced with um, psychology. They're my favourite brand of pens, by the way. I've got that. <laughs> um, but, it, but it's like... Yeah, look. <laughs> but it's... Um, yeah, so you saw the trends taking place. And I think those trends sort of reflected the way society's changed, isn't it? That, that you've got a lot less... Like, I, love, I really like that book, Community, by Peter Block. You know, there's a lot more, less people community-focused, and there's a lot more people who are individually focused. And it's, it's, it's really interesting, because you, you make that point about sociological type turning, and I, I've seen that turn throughout my career. And so not only is there less access to the arts for all kids, but especially working class kids, because the middle class kids, their parents can afford to send them to dance school in the evening or buy a musical instrument or whatever. But actual social sciences is, is reduced as well. So you've got a lot of... Um, and, and those subjects which is about challenging status quo and, and things like that. Yeah. But, but, you know, even the subjects that are taught, like economics, you know, the, if you look at the, what's, what's on the syllabus for economics... It's like really, in a way, quite old-fashioned, you know, still, you know, that's my degree, economics, and it's still really old-fashioned, uh, Keynesian versus monetarist, and it doesn't really bring in much like Marxian economics, it doesn't bring in anything that's more innovative or grass-led stuff. It's really, really fascinating uh, the whole landscape's changed in education. And I think if you're part, if, you, if you've joined it, say, in the noughties or whatever, you might think it's always been like this, but it had, it's not always been like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I started teaching Iliad, Hackman, you know, so it, it changes, it's, it's a huge change has taken place. Some of it for the good, but, for, but not, not all of it for the good. So certainly Ofsted's not been for the good. Ofsted creates a, a, has created a dynamic since 1992. I do believe there needs to be a regulator, but I think it's, it's a deficit model. It doesn't build, it doesn't, encourage schools to form communities and come together and stronger schools supporting weaker it doesn't encourage that so you remind me of uh, like uh, two two retired teachers sort of uh, well we developed friendships and one of them uh, was a teacher of history and uh, an inspector of schools Roy really Roy Wilshire lovely guy lovely guy and uh, he said much of the same thing. He has he, he's always saw his role and understood his role as collegiate. You know, he would go there and he was not there to find people and find the things that were wrong and punish people. He was there to Well, interestingly, um, I this training course that I talked about before, which I was running in London when I bumped into Matt. I, I ran and built a training course and eventually a training franchise with a big teacher training company, still running now, actually. Um, and it's helped a lot of people and I've done well out of it. But what's been interesting about that is that um, the, in order to expand it, I've needed a training team. So you recruit people that are generally ex-teachers, or, you know, um, and then you train them in the product because, you know, you've got you buy a master's Spencer jumper in Liverpool, it needs to be the same quality as a master's Spencer jumper in Plymouth, so you've got all the training, the quality assurance, and it was building franchise, which, um, as I say, is, is still alive today, only over 15, 16 years old. And we had lots of people applying and lots of people going through the interview process, and what I wanted to see on the interview is that they had that, 
good people skills. And we had a few people that were ex Austin inspectors applying or current Austin inspectors who were looking to diversify their, their income a little bit. And none of them made it through. And none of them made it through because their dynamic is top down. Their dynamic is find full. Their, their dynamic isn't finding bright spots or building people up or that collegiality you mentioned. And it was just really interesting. I think what it, what it bred, you know, there's some great offset inspectors out there, I'm sure. And I've met a couple. But there's a few comes from a, from a training course. Even their body language, there's a degree of like, you know, I know it all, I know more than you. And it's it's really, really, really interesting. The whole dynamic's interesting in this. And they just wouldn't be a good fit for, for that training team that I, was, that I was building. So we just didn't take them on. Yeah. But they thought they were a lot better than they were. I, I wonder how much we're seeing for the society activities and organisations being infected by a particular view of how you organise and manage people. There's a really interesting book called Confronting Managerialism. <laughs> well, I watched your lecture last night, actually, on the, on the Reddit um, University website, and I've, I've seen that. It's one of my list of books to read, but yeah, really it, interesting. It is really startling, because I, you know, I, 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 I've just spent a lot of time now asking people, maybe, you know, at first on the other side, you know, point, right, I, I'm here to try and work with you, you know, try, you're, you're going to help me, great, fantastic. And um, then just started asking everybody, how are, how are the ways you are being organized and organized and working out for you? And increasingly, I'm just finding people absolutely great. I, I don't know why I went doing this. Well, in your work, you must come across people from a range of sectors, but in the public sector, I definitely have friends who work in the NHS, work in education, people who work in the post office, the post yeah. office. And you've just got, and again, I, I, would, I would probably, I'm sure there's data on this. You look back at, say, those organisations 20 years ago, and the tiers of management now are just far more than there was then. Mm -hmm. And, and it's that, that creates a situation, doesn't it, where you're not listening to people on the ground. And in fact, it's worse than that. There's a lot of mistrust on people on the ground. And on the ground could be a post office counter in front of a group of kids in a school, um, yeah. working with people in a hospital as a nurse or doctor or whatever. And it's just, that's where we are. I think it's just, it's that managerialism, isn't it? It's that top down corporate culture that's come into everything and it imbues everything really. And it's, that's the thing, you know, going back to economics, the basic, the basic thing about economics, even at O level GCSEs, you learn that. Things like education is a public good. Yeah. Having yeah. having sewage system is a public good. <laughs> it's a, they, they, what, it's but that, those, those, that notion of public good has been like there's, there's predators who are out there to sort of say, well, actually, that's that we can make a bit of money out of that. Well, disaster capitalism has has become sort of a, a standard. And, yeah. And, it's amazing that the, the, the people in Westminster... Wait, I'll tell you what, Alex, you know, do you get a chance, um, if you look at some of the, the children now who... Um, there's some children who, for very different reasons, maybe uh, in relation to you know, behaviour issues or you know, autistic spectrum, all that type of thing. But there's some really interesting... There's, there's loads of special schools around the country and they're owned, not all, it's always some interest, they're, they're owned by big companies, some of them. Some of them are owned by companies that are like from Saudi Arabia. Like, you know, there, there's, a, there's a school on, on the outskirts of Liverpool where, you know, there's children there, there's stuff, and, and it's like, well, why would, why would they want to do that? Well, it's an obvious, yes, it's obvious, isn't it? Because there's money to be made in it, but then, then if you, if you, if you think of what, what you could do with that money, you could perhaps less of it went in profit and some more of it was invested in resource or, or put into supporting some of the families, you could really make a lot of difference. Yeah. 
It's really interesting the way, the way it's going. Uh, it, it, I, I refuse to be depressed about it because you've got to keep working and you've got to keep trying to make a difference. But mm-hmm. the landscape's changed massively, especially since free schools and, you know, the, the opportunity for people just to set up a school if they want to. And the money that was spent on that was just crazy. You know, uh, you know. And then there's people in a better, better place than me to tell you the, the waste that's been there. But, but again, coming back to another basic economic concept, which is opportunity cost. You know, you could have spent that money on other things. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got plenty of things you could spend it on. You could tell, ask head teachers in schools, could you spend them? Yeah, absolutely. And you could bring in more teachers, more support. Um, staff you can create more opportunities for students to do more arts and you know all those things that have been cut back but that money's leaving the system it, yeah i mean the the, the the school the country the culture the people the families capital which has been hemorrhaged and it's been going straight offshore yeah and you swear you know i i, I don't know why it's not being picked up on. It's hard for people stare at it from afar and go, well, surely there's something I'm not getting. Surely, you know, I, I read a, a psychologist uh, on, you know, big on cold thinking, mm. uh, spending his life taking, bringing people back out to it. Right. And the final book was dedicated to talking about cold behaviors. Uh, that run throughout society. Mm. And the, 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 the unquestioning dependence on a leader, on leadership. Somebody tells you something, you don't have to think about it, great. Mm. And, and it's a comforting position. Yeah. It's like the, he likens it to being in the back seat of a car mm. and you're looking out a window, you're, you're being driven to the place. You're going to be told what you need to do, mm. and you've got authority by proxy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And I'm wondering how much we, we're comfortable with thinking critically about what's happening, where the decisions are being made. Mm. Because they, uh, he, he, he quotes a journalist who got into the Bilderberg group uh, and, and went to report on these very brilliant minds who were planning out the future, had this master plan, and, and he reported back. Uh, I'm really shaken because when I got there, it was like walking through the flight cabin and finding that there's nobody at the controls. These aren't Superhuman people. These are people who can yeah. hold. Yeah, I mean, Professor Danny Dorlin says that, doesn't he? I love, I love um, his, his writing. Um, and I remember years ago when I used to uh, yeah, live in London, I saw a speech by Ken Livingston. He was talking about when he was ahead of the GLC meeting someone like the head of North, of, of Nat, Nat West, as it was called then, I think, you know, the bank. But, you know, this guy was just just really just like this old posh fellow and basically all the people under him made the decision. It was just like a figurehead really, you know. So this is this is what's what's happened, you know, like I think. Um yeah. It, yeah. It, I think there are, there are people that fight against it. Obviously that the fact is that things need to be exposed sometimes. And some and this is where, you know, journalists sometimes, uh, citizen journalists sometimes, paid journalists can really expose it. So for instance, um there was, there's an academy chain um, of schools over in Yorkshire, and now you got found out for, in their accounts, spending something a region of, I think, £60,000 on um, Tesla cars that the senior leaders were using for hiring these Tesla cars, you know, to go between meetings and schools and things like that. Yeah. It's just, it's just, a, it's just, a, it's, a, it's really, it, it's, it's exposing the immorality of that because, and then there's also um, Michael Sandel's work, uh, book, Mary, you know, The Tyranny and Merit. And I think this meritocracy myth, myth is something that we talk about in the book because, again, you get people that rise to the top of organizations, often who are from previous backgrounds. And then they, but they truly believe they deserve all those extra pay and extra um, 
you know, pension while they're exploiting the people that work for them. Right. You know, it's, it is, it's, it's mind-blowing, really, that yeah. people that run massive organisations are already billionaires seem to want more. And, the, and people are creating that. Sometimes people in their organisations are on minimum wage or even less than that. I don't know how they sleep at night. Well, <laughs> well yeah, I thought I'd actually be afraid to get some kind of rational account rather than just going, oh, well, the world agrees with yeah. Um, I, and I, I found my way into a dehumanization psychology. Yeah. I, I wound up reading, sorry to go, oh, and like, it was always through uh, friendships and relationships who said, people said, of course you can understand this. I'll talk, talk you through this. Mm. And the text that other people threw out, I'd pick up and I'd, I'd read, you know, um, and I said, sorry, uh, what? We're talking about meritocracy, where, Mer- yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I was a dehumanization cycle. Yeah. And I, was, I, I ended up sort of going, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, let, let's see what the United Nations has said. So he's... I started to chip into these documents and the likes of Gene uh, Zeidler, Professor Gene Zeidler, special raptor on the, the human right to feet. And, and he's pointing out that, I don't know, no, no, poverty and famine is human law. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2008, world's biggest wheat harvest ever. Mm-hmm. And, but, then uh, there was artificial inflation of the price of staple feeds deliberately by Wall Street mm. uh, and killed millions and millions of people. The UN is ra- uh, uh, reporting on this, uh, the likes of uh, F- Frederick Coffey, you know, Professor yeah. America, looks at it. So there's a pleasure. Well, that, that's the myth of free markets, isn't it? You know, the people on the right who talk about, oh, let's which you know, all markets are rigged, but they are, you know, many, many markets have to be regulated and capped. And, you know, even that, that's, I mean, one of the things that Dorlin talks about, which was a popular move in um, Greece, is just to cap the price of a cup of coffee. And so, like, why can't we do things like that? You know, just for people, not like saying coffee necessarily, but I'm saying that, you know, things like you know, rent caps. Um, but yeah, this is one of the things you talk about in the book. I think one, yeah. one of the things, you know, reading around classism, one of the challenges that um, I think there are different forms of classism. We talked about downward classism, that sense of, I think if you're from a, a higher class, you feel that you deserve to be that person in power, that person making decisions. And then that, that and, and the internalized classism, which is interesting as well, because I think if you're, say, from a working class background, you can start to limit your own life trajectory and sense, well, you know, or someone like me can't be in that social space now, the peer board, your um, dimension to it. And that was really, really interesting. It was really interesting to go back to a few old sociology books and reread Bourdieu and people like that and sort of talking about things like, you know, social space and where one feels comfortable. You know, and, and you know, I think um, I'm certainly yeah, someone who's got friends in different social classes. And the times I've been into situations and probably not shown myself in a good light because I sort of felt, like, I remember going to an awards dinner and then nearly ended up in a fight, for instance. <laughs> and that was bad, that was my bad. But, I, I, but again, the guy, the guy next to me was like talking down to me, talking down about Liverpool and being a real, I thought being a real ass. So anyway, I won't go to any more fucking award dinners, that's for sure. But, um, but, but that was partly me. That's partly my internalised. Well, I shouldn't really be here, you know. And 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 it's. I come across that a lot with some people and families. That there's that sense of um, they internalise their place, if you like. Yeah. And and what the private schools do very very well is that for the more affluent kids, they take their safe cycle to internalise their own sense of place which is at the top of organisations. And this, this, again, goes back to merit. You know, there's people that kid themselves that they're there through merit. Yeah, there's a lovely... You know, I'm, I'm thinking about... Um, 
Well, there was like a quote here where you realized uh, it was at Manchester where I first met people from private school. Yeah. They seemed to be much more self-confident. It took me over a year to realize that, that confidence didn't equate to intelligence. Uh, one tutorial stands out for me still. A guy talking uh, and a light bulb lit in my head. I realized he wasn't bothered if he was right and wrong. In fact, he was an idiot. Uh, me, I was scared of saying anything that might be incorrect. And I find myself looking at Westminster and yeah. thinking, this is by and large what we're seeing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of representation, you know, if you look at, look at MPs from, from all political parties, um, but sadly, you know, the Labour Party too, there's, there's not enough representation from working class people within the political um, domain. And where, where the emphasis has been placed, and in many ways it makes sense to place a lot of emphasis on areas such as race, gender, sexuality, which I totally agree with, class, because it's not in a protected characteristic under the law, and sometimes it's difficult to define, is, is, is neglected and is not really focused on. But, you know, you'll know yourself from some of your work and some of my research as well that people get treated differently due to their accent, due to the fact they've got tattoos, due to the fact they've got a certain haircut. Well, whatever colour you are, it's, and, and that's the person making the decision often is the person without that haircut, without those tattoos, who's got a, a bit higher income. But, but going back to that story at university, when I did go to university, and I'm going back to Manchester today, um, for, for, um, and I'll probably walk past the university. It was a tutorial, and I, I still remember the guy, because it's sometimes a bit of a private school look where you've got a jumper, but you've got a shirt underneath with like the collar sort of, sort of sticking up a little bit, it's like a striped shirt. And I'm just there in a pair of jeans and a jumper, and my mum knitted for me probably. Uh, she was a good knitter, still is. Um, but yeah, it was just like that. It was a light bulb moment for me. And then I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have that feeling, you know, to just to... to, to, to... And, um, and then later you start thinking, well, why have I got that feeling? You know, my level results were probably just as good as him. I didn't have a private tutor, and I didn't even have many good teachers either. But I went down my local library and I sort of, you know, muddled through. Learned a few things by rote, that's for sure. Um, we got through some exams that way. But yeah, it's that, that sense of, I mean, I, I, went, I remember going to Manchester and thinking, right, I, I, well, I had my own bedroom for the first time. I'd take my football boots. Right. <laughs> I'd say, I had a bag full of stuff, went on the train. I thought I'd be here for two weeks. I didn't even know anybody been to university. And in a way, getting in the, um, getting in the football team is the thing I probably enjoyed most. I did enjoy the course and that sort of thing. Um, and there were some you know, people I met on the course and people I met through football and people I, I lived with. Um, but having that degree has changed my life. It really has. It opened up a career path that otherwise wasn't there. And, and I'd like to think that these programs I'm trying to set up in schools, these scholars programs, are doing the same thing. Well, I know they are, because, you know, the students now are coming back from university and they're talking to some of the younger ones now in some of the places that I'm working, like Kirby and, and Lancashire and Bradford. And I'm really proud of that. I, I don't like just doing drive-by training. I do like, I, do, I, I, I create courses that last for years. And if, and if I can scale them up, I will. This one, I'm not going to be able to scale up by employing other trainers, but what I'm trying to do is go into schools and go into for a few years and then training staff to work alongside me and then I'll gradually step away and that thing still exists as, as, a, as, an, as a product. But I think that schools aren't, aren't very good at that. I think schools are, by and large have a, a sense of, because they're under-resourced, there's a curriculum to deliver especially as the children get older, both in Scotland and England, we've got to make sure we deliver them to the hires and to the standard exams and to the GCSEs and to the A-levels. And that's only right. But I think there's a, um, there's a, a percentage of kids who are not being served well by that exam-focused system. Yeah. And they need 
something else and they shouldn't be made to feel that there's something wrong with them. And that's, that's what the other big issue is going, you know, there, yeah. you know. It, no, absolutely. It, it, it's appalling that mm. this even exists in you know, one person. It's like you said about hierarchy before. It's like, there's the, the, you know, it, it, the phrase gold standard has been used about A-level before. But, but you know, it, 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 there are some vocational courses that are just fantastic courses. Some, some that, by the way, no longer exist. And they are... The people that come to them and go into a career path can really, really benefit a lot more people than, um, and, and you know, the students are highly intelligent in a different way. And I just don't think that, well, we get stuck in, well, not we, but some, some people get stuck in the sense that, that there is a standard that's best. You know. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's me. You know, being bitter. I went to Manchester University, I went to Russell Group University, but I didn't even know what Russell Group was when I went. I just went to what I thought was a university that I liked. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm sure Oxford and Cambridge are fa fantastic. But I think that um, yeah. there's a lot of universities, I do a bit of work with Keele University, for instance, but they're chill and they're great universities. And you, know, you get a degree there and you get people on a path and they end up being happier and more productive. I just think that's, that's a fantastic thing, you know. So if I can contribute a bit to that, and get a few more kids on that path, that'd be good. And if I can get a few schools to change the way they think about their curriculum and not be so rigid and be a little bit more dynamic and a bit more empathetic without lowering expectations. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. In the book, you, you uh, structure uh, your, your vision into three main uh, sections. So you've got equality, um, where you're, you're thinking about providing uh, a, a poor curriculum and extra cur uh, curricular activities. Mm. Now that's interesting that mm. your life outside of the institution mm. is as a, you know, a consideration uh, as important it has what's happening inside. Yeah. Um, and thinking about the places where, where I've lived most of my life. Uh, so uh, let's think about uh, there's a real estate called uh, Oxgowns in Edinburgh and it's in three high rise flats and it's demolished. What part of Edinburgh was that, Alex? In, in South Edinburgh. Right. Um, and these, these flats have been built as luxury flats right, yeah. under, all, all over the, the thing. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the advances of the day, and they had immediately fallen down because contractors had cut out every element they were useful. The result was I'd been moved into there mm. uh, seven years after they'd been marked unfit for human habitation. Along with right? mm -hmm. uh, uh, to keep alive, I had to say, the community was amazing. The people were amazing. I, I still think, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of talking to a lot of educators, a lot of you know, well healed people. Yeah. But the, the warmth, the warmth. The warmth yeah. and the sharpness, yeah. and the natural yeah. wit and apprehension. I, I, uh, it's, it's like when I, if, you know, if I walked into a, a church or a temple, I don't, I don't think you're any more likely to find somebody who's only in there. You know, mm. pe people have the same things going on outside of these things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember being asked, would you have got this great idea, install a local enterprise token system? Mm. Here's the machine, Alex, when mm. you do it, mm. you know you're a social connector. And I said, you don't understand. There's nowhere to install them. Mm. There's a pub, there's a bookie, mm -hmm. there's a post office, there's a, a grocer yeah. which sells instant noodles and smokes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but that's it, these, yeah. these are deserts. These these yeah. are economic deserts. Yeah. And therefore sociological level deserts. The people are dying and survive. Yeah. Well, if you put people down a mine, they'll survive. You know that. Mm -hmm. Um so I am quite interested in how you how so, so I added to, add, well, well, well added to that. I mean, the, the first 
Taylor, if you like, is about equality. But first of all, I think we give the statistics in the book, so I could be off a little bit, but there's been you know, hundreds of youth clubs that have closed in the last 15 years have been, and you know, that would have been a perfect place for those tokens that you mentioned before. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't have got to university if it wasn't for my local library, right? right? Because, because there just wasn't space where we lived to study. And if I did take up space, well, they got shouted at. Um, so I think there's something like over a thousand libraries are closed. And certainly the library, I used to study in London. Um, you know, that's a mosque now, and nothing against that, but it's just not a library anymore. And a lot of libraries that are open um, are more multi-purpose now. And I just like, needed a quiet place to work, in all honesty. That's what I needed. Um, because exams are still done in silence. And, you know, I just think that it's important to, to have done. Well, I, I, I think that the, 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 the extracurricular thing as well, that, again, um, the figures will be in the book, and, but even if you do a little bit of research on this, you know, there are less kids now going on trips. And it's not just because of the pandemic. There's a fear from some teachers, I guess, on the health and safety side of things. There's the cost of diesel on a very basic level is put the cost of coach trips up. You know, there were, there were things like this in the real world, which means it's harder and harder. And so if you want to make trips free and, and some money that, that's for, for pupil premium or pupil equity, fund money can go towards that. Okay. Um, that, that. That's doable, but you know, what a lot of schools are having to do is keep going to teachers, keep going to parents, sorry, for, for more financial contributions. And it is challenging. So, you know, I, th I think I mentioned it in the book, that, you know, I was playing for um, football team Harringay Borough when I was a kid, uh, a teenager, and they had a tour to Holland, and I was the only one who didn't go because my parents didn't have the money. And then everybody comes back, they've got new track suits and all that experiences and all that. And, I just felt too well, I felt shite, you know what I mean? So and and so what you want to do if you if you can get trips and get as many kids going on those trips as possible, and some of them are you know fun trips, Orton Towers, Blackpool, some of them are like educational trips, museums, or just going in the countryside. But kids generally love that experience, and especially for the those who haven't had the opportunity to go with parents, or they're from a background where the parent hasn't got a car or a carer hasn't got a, you know. That, that sort of um, means a chance for. So again, the reason we said equality, including extracurricular, yeah. is that we think it's really important to have over the um, journey to... I mean, the book's mainly aimed at secondary schools, but, you know, some primary teachers have, have read it and have got a lot out of the book. We reckon, oh, we, well, we reckon there's about 5,000 hours of curriculum time that you experience if you go through a secondary school, that's five years, about a thousand hours a year. And I think if you go through five years of secondary education, surely you should go on quite a number of different trips. Surely you should have quite a number of experiences that are a little bit different from what you would have got. Surely you should meet a number of different people. Surely, and, and, and that, that's quite a big number, 5,000. And, and I, I'm using that, I guess, when I speak to conferences, to head teachers, not to shame them, but to get a little bit of a sense of, you know, they should go to the theatre <laughs> over, the, over those five years. They should go on some sort of nature walk type activity. They should go on um, a number of different uh, excursions, trips. And one of the things we do in the book, because I'm, I'm, cause we're practical people, yeah. we go through to the average teacher. Here's how you take a trip. Here's how you do a risk assessment. Here's the sort of places you can take kids. The Here's the sort of places that are free. Here's what you do before you go on the trip. Here's how you prepare the students behaviour-wise, prepare them on the coach, prepare them on the train. Here's what you do when you come back from a trip. In a way, that section of the book could use also be a book in itself called How to Take Kids on Trips and Why You Should Take Kids on More Trips. But there's less kids going on trips. Yeah. And that's another reason why, as a bit of a call to arms, we're sort of saying, if you've got all this curriculum, but even if you haven't got the money, or your community hasn't got the money, can you be creative? And, and one of the things that we found with some schools is some schools are being much more creative about raising money, mm -hmm. uh, getting sponsorship, getting coach companies to 
um, help us. You know, one school uh, in Kirby has its own 55 seater coach. Uh, you know, there are things you can do to reduce the cost and make it more, more easy to get kids out. So like where we're sitting today, which is fact in Liverpool, there's a school in Kirby, and four times a year you'll take kids here on the Scholars Programme. Fantastic. And they'll see films, you know, see films like Get Out, Something in the World of People, um, and we'll have a bit of a discussion after the film in the, in the cinema itself. They'll do a piece of work on it. Um, they look at IMDb, they look at film reviews, and encourage to look at other different types of films. And all we're trying to do is extend their understanding of different genre of film or something they wouldn't ordinarily watch and take them outside their comfort zone a bit. And what that do is give us a bit of a reduction. Um, and again, you know, sometimes just through being a little bit entrepreneurial or be a little bit cheeky, you can get some of the other end to like give you a reduction or even give you something free. Yeah, and, there's and, a lot and, of good you, will. There's a lot of good will. Lot of good will. And, and equally, um, on the Scholars Programme, in the three schools that I'm running it, we've got some students who, we, we collect quite a lot of evidence from students, especially as they get towards age 16, what would you like to do post 16? And we, we've got some students who want to study things like law, or want to study things like engineering, or want to study things like medicine, but they know nobody who does those things. So what we've built up is a network of people who, can physically meet them or meet them on Zoom. So like if I tell you last year, we had over 20 group Zoom calls with uh, three different barristers, uh, someone who is a makeup artist in a film company, because one of my students wanted to get into film makeup, um, mm -hmm. a couple of writers. And in every case, those people were very happy to give their time for free. Yeah. It happens of an evening, say six to seven. And we've got another schedule of Zooms taking place next year. And obviously, you, you use those people again. But what we found is, by there's a lot of people out there that don't work with young people at all. They just don't do that in their career. And they're only too pleased to help. But you've got to go and ask. You've got to seek it out. Yeah. And I just don't think you should just accept the fact that, oh, because, because this kid wants to study law and in this part of Liverpool, and they don't know someone, that's, that's their job to Hey, you know what, they're trying to help that kid to get those social connections. And again, it comes back to Bourdieu and social capital, doesn't it? That you're, um, you're trying to help kids to build some social capital and, you know, improve their networks, if you like. And those networks can improve their knowledge. And there's a lot of people in this network now through trips and through Zoom calls and through people coming to school that, you know, can put you onto somebody else or... So you're treating this, this massive business root ball. Well, I probably think very similar to you, actually. Like, I, t I tend to think like that. I, I guess probably unconsciously, I'll say, so, right, okay. So, like, my daughter Anna um, and her friend Megan, they run a, um, a CIC called Dramatic Recovery. They do drama for mental health in the community. Jessica Hines is, is their patron, the actress, etc. And Simon Pegg's just come, come on as a patron as well. And they... Um, uh, they, it's, uh, Jessica's made this little 20 minute video which just, it shows their work. I'll send it to you, Alex, yeah. after this, and if you can distribute it, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. But they work in the community, you know, they work in schools, they work in social prescribing, which is really, yeah. really, really interesting. And in some parts of the country, people have never heard of social prescribing. But basically, for, for people that don't know, it's when GP services um, take a um, and give people non-clinical interventions, so like art therapy, in this case, drama therapy, you know, whatever. And it's good, it helps people, it's massive. And, and the film shows um, some people's stories, how dramas help them, and, and a lot of those people are able to come to, the, uh, come to the event. And just through going on a walking weekend with some mates, I got, I got talking to my mate's mate, who is like a real big corporate coach. He goes all over the world. And I said to this fella, Ali McIver, his name, lovely fella. I said to him, would you give my daughter like a, a Zoom call? Like a, you know, because he's not very good at networking and sort of stuff. Yeah, you're only too pleased. And he's going to do a bit of work with some students next year as well. And he's like, you know, he goes to Japan and, and 
Singapore and whatever, but there are people that are just happy to do that and they're great at time management as well. I said, yeah, I'll give you an hour, an hour of their time over a year, maybe even a few hours. It's nothing to those people. They do it while they're eating their sandwich. And, but it's massive for the person at the other end, you know, and, and that's the thing. It's waiting. It's a moment in their life that becomes... And, and some parts of the country, country that you mentioned before, like, you know, I've done some work in Gilmerton in Edinburgh. There are some parts of the country that, you know, are known as the, the left-behind places, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And as much as... The, and, and I'm from London originally. If you're from London, you know, with a bit of cheekiness and entrepreneurialism, you're not too far away from a big company or... I think you can knock on their door and... But there are some parts of the country where there's no, nothing like that around the corner. Yeah. And so, in a way, this is where perhaps... Um, technology can come in again and help us because, you know, you're talking live to someone. I mean, uh, Deb Walder used to be the senior social, uh, the senior barrister in South Wales. You know, she's based in South Wales and, and my students will have a Zoom with her from their houses in Liverpool. And you know, she gives up her time, um, but it wouldn't be feasible for her to come up or them to come down. So it, it, it's just one example, a bit like trips, of being a bit more creative and sort of saying, right, well, okay, that kid has got a little bit of a gap there. That kid wants to do that, but there's a bit of a gap there. What can we do? And at the other, it's probably the one way, frankly, the other end of the scale, you've got a kid who's been three years in secondary school, yeah. he's still demotivated, he still hasn't really got his mojo. Let's see if we can find our kids something, or like one day a week, give him that little bit of a lift. And I, I've seen it with just giving kids work experience, let alone putting them on you know, getting them on an apprenticeship route or whatever. And some schools are brilliant at doing that. And all the book is trying to suggest is more ways to do that for different types of kids. And, and it does require a creative, flexible mindset in leadership just to sort of say, right, okay, let's spot these kids. And that not, not just tolerate a kid being hating school for five years and then leaving. Not just tolerating a kid who's, you know, got some dream about doing a career, but we know deep down that without us supporting that kid, they're not going to get anywhere near that. So, you know, that, that's, yeah, that's where we come from, really, Matt and I, in, in writing this. And that's where, in every section of the book, we say, right, this is how you do it. This yeah. is what this school does. This is how you can do it. And it's, what's also good is that these aren't based on it, oh, speculative ideas. These schools are actually currently doing this now. And some of them, because Matt and I have worked in there and helped set these things up, and others... They, they find their own ways of doing those things. I mean, there's a, there's a, a school down south that gives kids, kids a cultural passport. So you come into the school in secondary school, but when you leave, you know, you have, your passport will be stamped with all those things, a theatre trip, yeah. um, giving, a public, giving a public presentation, uh, climbed up a mountain. And then, okay, there's all those other things, maths, English, so absolutely fantastic. But you're not telling me in 5,000 hours schools can't also allocate a couple of members of staff to, to, to overlook and oversee those type of things. And, um, and a couple of senior leaders' remit should be, let's just make sure that we've got equality for all of our students. Well, True we, equality. No. We can see the universe in the grain of sun. And you know, the way that knowledge has become earmarked out, and I, I call it the librarian's problem, you know, right, okay, so I've got this book. If I put it on the English shelf, I can't put it on the history shelf too. But wait a minute, it has more than one place. It has multiple places. So you go you go out and you can I would argue you can find all subjects in all places, really. I, and it's uh, you know, you're doing place based well, learning. Well, well not, well, knowledge knowledge is interesting because you know that the, the language of lots of schools is the knowledge agenda, knowledge-driven schools, knowledge-rich schools. I'm really comfortable with that. But we've also got to interrogate whose knowledge and what in those 5,000 hours, what knowledge should we teach. So one of the things we suggest in the book, for instance, is certain knowledge domains that are underrepresented, one of them being social knowledge. And, and I actually think this helps people from a higher social background as well, that you, you, you go through... Um, just as you would expect in a 21st century school, 
experiencing different authors from different cultures and different races and different genders, should you not also realize that a lot of people are very, very talented from working class backgrounds and have been very, very successful? Should you not also realize some of the greatest writers are from working class backgrounds? But again, it's something that's barely mentioned. And so, so I think it, it, what, what that section of the book encourages people to look at, and then we also recommend films that perhaps can be looked at. And I'm a great believer in film education and film, and, and to see, you know, film, film studies as well. I think, I think it's very engaging for lots of students. And, and some students, even as much as you encourage them, won't get into the reading habit. But a really interesting film curriculum over those 5,000 hours could also teach them a lot of cultural capital and create a lot of curiosity and spin-offs from their own sense. So like when we uh, take students to see Hunt for the Wilder People, we might talk about, you know, Maori rights, might talk about colonisation, might talk about uh, some environmental issues to do with New Zealand and, and that type of thing. And I'm not trying to crowbar in those issues, but it's just, that it's just in themselves, it's in themselves that the work of art or the piece of art creates an opportunity to do deeper learning. And, and, and I just think that it's nice to get students out of school, sitting in a cinema, um, getting them to think and that sort of thing. And, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good believer in that. But, but the knowledge bit of it, so we talk about also more knowledge of personal knowledge. So I, I, I wouldn't say I follow it necessarily, but I do think there's a lot to be said for like building up a sense of understanding of one's own philosophy. I like Stoicism as a philosophy, for instance. <laughs> so it's like, well, let's, let's study Stoicism, let's study Buddhism, let's study things that may be outside of our ear a little bit. Um, Stockholm Gladiator, here's Mark. It's for real. Like, yeah, you give me an idea. Yeah. But, also, but also, you know, getting people to, um, to recognise that emotional regulation is key to success to a large extent. So how can you help... And at the moment, there's big issues of anxiety. And I'm developing a new course, um, which is around anger management with, with students. And again, what I always do is do some pilots and then I'll refine it and then I'll, you know, put it out there and, and do that. And this may be because I'm intellectually curious about it because I, I do some blind voting with students where I first meet them. So I get them to, you know, cover their eyes and ask, uh, put their hands up to certain questions. Okay. And you know, there's there's a, there's a there's a lot there's a lot of kids who are angry. There's a lot of kids who are telling me they're anxious or too stressed out. And really? okay, right. So if I know that, when aren't I aren't I duty bound to try to help you with that? So again, I think more of the curriculum should be should be dedicated to that type of knowledge. And then we also talk about cultural knowledge being expanded. Again, that's often just an add on these days. Um, um, but we're still in favour of, of disciplinary knowledge of learning of you know, maths and English and all that sort of things. But we're just asking for a little bit of the, the balance to be brought back to those other dimensions, you know. Well, I've done a lot of learning in public houses, pubs. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and those moments where people have, you know, have reached out to me and gone, you know, oh, oh okay, how have you seen but I do know that you can look at it this way as well. Yeah. And take it up. But it's also dialogue, isn't it? it? It's also dialogue. And, and again, you know, one big push. It looks almost inevitable now that Labour are going to get in. And, and in England, certainly the big push will, will go on oracy, which I've got no problem with. However, it, like a lot of things, it can be interpreted as, right, let's teach kids how to speak properly. Let, let's teach kids to lose their accent, lose their dialect. It's very, very, and so there's an Oracy Commission that's been um, set up, and an, an, an or, the Oracy Commission. So the Oracy Commission, as in um, O R A C Y, um, and looking to improve the quality of students' talk. But but part of part of part of that, and that's really important. Yeah. But there are different types of talks. So there's a, there's a guy called Robin Alexander who's done some great work on this. But the talk that, for me, that's probably underrepresented is dialogue and discussion. Things like rote, um, and that, that's probably out there already, and there's a few other types of talk that 
I think a lot of schools envisage, envisage that you're trying to get more contributions from kids answering questions. But I want more kids asking questions and raising questions and, and having you know, philosophical discussions and things like that. So that, as I say, um, when you put, in my experience, and this goes back a long way, if you put an interesting experience in front of kids, don't have no problem talking at all because all they want to do is talk about it. And then towards the end of that, if you want to correct them grammatically, certainly before it goes into a piece of writing, especially that writing's going to be assessed, I've got no problems with that. But I, I fear that some schools will correct kids grammatically too quickly and stifle that curiosity, stifle that dialogue. No, you're talking to someone in the pub, you don't really correct someone who says ain't rather than isn't or whatever. You're just like, oh, okay. And, it, and it's interesting, I think sometimes the actual talking of the ideas is seen as secondary to the being grammatically correct. And again, I think that's another class is construction. That, so we've got to be careful of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking, and I think we try and do this in the book as much as possible, Alex. We're trying, to, we're trying to say, look, if you've got kids who've got low engagement, right? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you tried that? And if you have, if you tried all those things, great. And a lot of those suggestions are in the book. But you've got to try lots of different things. Yeah. You've got a lot of thousands of hours to do that. You shouldn't accept that. <laughs> and, and, you know, the biggest thing is, is making sure you've got high-quality teachers in front of those kids yeah. Yeah. who feel valued, who, who feel well-trained. And if you want kids to um, improve the quality of discussions and things like that, then you've got to train and enable staff to do that and probably take, take some of the pressure off so many exams as well. Create a bit of space for people to do a bit more project learning and, you know, community-based. It, it's, it's nice when you see an outcome. It's certainly nice for, for, for my students. You see an outcome that benefits the community. So we've got a group, we've got a group of students recently who they, do, they did like an outward bounds, like a walk-in day. But um, one, of the, one of my colleagues suggested, um, well, why don't we do some fundraising for all the home hospital? Now, this is a socially deprived area, what I'm talking about here, and they raised over £2,000, these kids, and they did the long walk. It's a win-win, isn't it? It's a total win-win. And that is just... Well, they, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Paul, the member of staff, who's brilliant, bought more than ice cream, but he's that type of fellow as well. It's like 50 kids. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that's the point, isn't it? That's, that, that's the thing. That it's, it's, I'd love to get in front of more staff and say, look, you know, what, what little bit of extra can you do it? There's probably not going to be too much more use of your time, but actually the, 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 um, the multiplier effect, another economic term I've thrown in there, can be massive. The, the leverage effect of you spending a couple of hours a week of an after-school club that does that and the impact you make on those kids' lives can be massive. So I'm encouraging you know, more after-school clubs, more teachers to take trips, and we're suggesting ways that that's an easier thing to do. And actually, in my experience, that's probably the most enjoyable part of the day and part of the week. You've got a little bit of freedom. Kids see you in a different light. They treat you in a different way. So we want more people to do that, really. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Cheers. You're right, you're right. No, I'm right, thanks. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's a bunch of my memories. But, I mean, I, I really struggle reading and life. And so I do a few things through conversation and asking questions. Yeah. Uh, and that really was seen as a problem. How did you, do, how did you manage with your um, PhD then? How did you do that? Uh, well, I, 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 it's not a PhD, it's a master's. Oh, but I, I'm hoping to yeah. find a route. This is the first full qualification I've got. Right. Uh, and I, I would do every... Every skill, every capacity, every yeah. piece of uh, human development. But Alex, if you ever get into, I mean, I'm not brilliant, but between me and Matt, if you put something out and you want a bit of editing, I'll just be happy to help with that, honestly. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take you. Not that bit out, obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not trying to look good. I'm just saying that no. it, it's a nice little... But, but it's, it's, just the, it's just the way it works, isn't it? I mean, some years ago, we looked into living theory as a type of... I don't know if you come across this, no. but... Well, I think something like 10, 15 years ago, there were living theory degrees and masters. And living theory, and I don't know how they got off the ground, and I'll have to do a bit more research, but the idea was that someone such as a teacher could go through a program. So the, 
the course that I created was about video analysis, really, this franchise cool. built up. And from which you learn somewhat about your habits and somewhat about setting targets that are needs driven and that type of thing. So it's, it's it, it, you go through a, you know, a cycle of watching yourself three times, three training sessions, three feedbacks. But everything's carefully, um, carefully designed to get you to be experimental and to reflect and those you know, logs you need to build and stuff like that. And actually, there was a couple of, there was, I think, one university that was saying to us, well, actually, that could be part of a living theory master's degree. They could get 60 units for that. But it never really got off the ground. And again, I, I, I'd like to think, without dumbing down or watering down, I'd like to think universities could be a bit more flexible and get in how they assess. And, and, it, and, 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 and you know, because you could, now someone like yourself, for instance, could be interviewed and then perhaps someone could help that go into a piece of text or it could just be assessed through film or does that make sense but again it's that it's where it's where it's where we are in 2024 but we're also in 2024 in getting hundreds of kids of you into examples sitting at individual desks with a pen and a piece of paper being it's just it's just crazy it's just crazy so and we and, and we and we sort of accept it and i and i think all we're trying to do in the book is say to schools, look, I'm not against exams. In fact, I'm very pro exams in many ways. But could we have a, a few less? Could we actually get you guys to come off that treadmill sometimes, that conveyor belt, and think about creating a bit of space for some other things that might be more experiential, might create more engagement, might be more reflective? Yeah, those things might have a bit of a cost, but could we find some creative ways to get that money and... You know, that's, 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 that's what we do. Use another economic term, the positive externality. Yeah, yeah. That come yeah. of, of you, yeah. know, you, you put this effort in now. Yeah. And there are people. They may well, be easy to measure. Wait, well, I'm just, I'm, you're going to use the word measure, and that's part of the problem again. It almost seems that everything has to be measured. Oh, yeah. Now, that, it's that, obsessive. I think that's okay to an extent, and, and I think that's important. Accountability is important because... I mean, I remember at school myself having um, one of my A-levels, the, the A-level teacher, had taught the wrong syllabus. We go into the exam hall. This is at A-level, and I'm doing it European and English history, and they're um, behind. Um, sorry, go I just, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I just stopped to drink my <laughs> coffee, and I ended up overhearing what you were saying. There's a wonderful book called Undoing the Grade, Oh, okay. By Jesse Someone. Okay. I can't remember what the surname was. Great. Thank you. And I'm currently yeah. trying to do practice research at the university to just get rid of that whole concept of grading. Yeah. Because it's just not. But Alex, Alex is interviewing me today about my new book, you see. So I, I, I write, that's my new latest book, and I'm Andy Griffith. Very interesting right. stuff. So, and Alex runs the Ragged University, which is oh, yeah, yeah. really, yeah. really interesting. So, yeah, I'm doing a – we're just interested in that, both of us. But I, I guess I'm trying to think out loud, how do we achieve that? And, um, well, I think it's much so, in schools. Well, it is because – well, Aust- uh, yeah, they are. And I think – I mean, I'm just based in school. So, like, Ofsted, if, if, a, if a head teacher – and there's some brave head teachers out there, some brilliant head teachers out there. But you always, you always have to justify taking some kids off of the exam pathway. And there's just too many kids do it. I mean, you, about, about age six, I mean, there's some kids done GCSEs recently. So you'll, do, you'll sit about 20 papers over about a three to four week period. It's just too much. It's, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's one way of assessing it. And you've got, just, if you've got someone on that day who's got hay fever or if someone's ill or whatever, it'll affect. And, and the other thing you know, I've always said mm-hmm. is when we have all these conversations about what to ship a tariff to you for accepting people onto our courses. Yeah. And as I say, the tariff tells you nothing at all. The ability of that student. Or, 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 so, or who's their private tutors. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. So it, it, this is what we, we talked before about meritocracy, is that false meritocracy. It's, so. it's absolutely, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I can get no, no, I'm going to go a bit of water. Diana, I've got to make a 
Oh, God. Do you want to get water? Oh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I have to use it, sounds like, except to do something really creative, clearly it sounds, where you're asking the students to do something that in real life they'd have to do in a limited time period. I, uh, it's, uh, it's really important we find ways of society valuing knowledge by the capacity where it is. Uh, these, these industrial schemes are causing so much collateral damage. Exactly. Uh, and so the, 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 even, even the way that society has become stratified, like uh, this age group plays with this age group, this age group plays with, you know, uh, and, and what, uh, what, what's unusual, I, I've got friends from, you know, uh, uh, nieces and nephews and their friends, you know, all, all 90, you know, in their 90s. And, and it's just not something that, that is in my head. Oh, I'm talking to somebody who's old or young. It's just like, uh, but, but it, it's, we, we, we become a highly industrialized and organized society. And, well, and, and we grade everybody. We agree, don't we? I... And, and, and I hate it. I mean, I said, you know, I, I was saying to someone I knew a couple of days ago, the reason why I want to retire is because I can't bear marking it. Because <laughs> it used to be students yeah. in Smith World, I would then have enough time to be able to speak to every single student, and I wouldn't give them their mark until I was having that conversation with them. Yeah. So I'd explain why the offer is there. Now yeah. we just asked to put numbers up. Yeah. The students have this, you know, this number is handed down in one time with a little bit of feedback, yeah. but then no chance to discuss it or explain it. And, and we're just being set up as these people who are judging them. Yeah. yeah. That's not education. Well, you know, we, I, I, I think that's why it's, uh, it's so inspiring. To like 15 years ago, I started uh, learning about social traditions of learning, education, and uh, developing the relationships. 15 years before, I was invited onto a master's course because of the work that I, I've done. Yeah. But it's in you know the community, and and to be valued, well, well, it's like an emotional. And where did you do your masters? What, what, who, Queen, who, Queen, Queen, Queen Margaret Ealing. So yeah. teachers get, uh, got in touch. Oh, that's and, great. And they said, "Look, well, that'd be nice if there the was class. more of that, wouldn't they?" Well, accreditation of prior yeah. learning, yeah. widening yeah. participation. Down the barriers between universities and communities. I mean, I do also a lot of work on decolonizing mm. the academy. Mm. I, I work on Southern mm. Africa, mm. and I was at a conference a few years ago where we had a series of panels on this. Yeah. By the time we got to the end, we said, if we're serious about decolonising the university, we actually need to understand. Mm. Because universities are set up as gatekeepers. Well, it's, 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 it's another part of financialisation of education, isn't it? It's another, it's another part of that. And having children have gone through university, they're not really getting value, and you guys are not really getting paid enough, and your pensions getting raided, and, yeah. you, and you wonder where's all the money going. Yeah. You really wonder, yeah. you know. Yeah. So. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, it's been nice of me. No, no, not at all. So I've, I've, I've got to get a train about four, so I've got so, not a so massive rush, but I've got about an hour left, really. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, it would be lovely, lovely to get uh, to hear more about your work. Please do get in touch. Now, uh, Andy's book is, I've, I've just been, you know, really, I mean, hit by it. it it's, it's a book to really study. Well, I'll also order it for all my <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious that I've really gone through some of them, but you take that. So, do you want to do you want to take the lead now? Because I feel like it's just been a, a nice rambling conversation. No, let me well, let, let me listen to what you want to ask me now. Well, listen, listening, yeah. and find you know, listening to the path that people take yeah. you yes. through. Thank you. Uh, through their journey, through how they understand. 
their vision is really important. I, lo I love learning uh, through interview has been such a powerful way of doing Well, maybe it. I can ask you something before you jump yeah, into yeah. that, because one of Matt's ideas, perhaps you can help us with this, is that I'm a bit, I'm someone who like, if you give me a goal, I'll work to it. So when I've written books before, I need the contract, I need the deadline. Mm -hmm. I've run marathons, yes. I need to know what day is that again. <laughs> right. Otherwise, I just won't. I'll, I'll do stuff, but I'll, I'll lose track. But one of the things we're talking about, we haven't got a publisher for this yet, is maybe doing a book about, loosely speaking, working class heroes, people that I guess should be studied in school, people that everybody should know about. I'm not saying that necessarily needs to be famous, but if you, I'm not necessarily now, Alex, but any thoughts on that now, what that might look like? Because again, a lot of it would be interview based, and you might say, and I met this guy who runs a boxing club in. See, I would love like doing what you're doing, start going down and say, you know what, can I just have a chat with you? Yeah. You know, I, and I created a podcast a few years back and it sort of died a death really. You know, I listened to it called Community Talks. And the idea about Community Talks is you talk, talk to people in the community who are doing something a bit innovative. Um, yeah. But anyway, that, 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 that's an idea that Matt's got. And I'm not against it, but what, we'd, what, we'd, what I'd probably say to him is, well, We'd need to work backwards from a publisher wanting to publish that, or you know, maybe a podcast. I don't know. But well, I've, I've got I've yeah. got a lot of ideas. I mean, I think you're 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 both doing a really important thing with this book and and your and your work. Um, have you read the Intellectual Lives of Working Classes of Britain by Jonathan Rose? I have. Yeah. Now, what is really screaming to me is yeah. right at the beginning, he says, well, one of the problems we've got is we lack some of, you know, a lot of social documentation of the intellectual contributions of people. Um, and uh, I've, been thinking, I've been trying to excavate that, but also say it to people, remind people that this social practice that I'm doing mm. has been done, and there's a lot, there are long traditions of it. And, and knowledge... including all histories as well, which is really interesting too, because yeah. when I used to, when I first came to Liverpool, um, just up the road here, there was a trade union resource centre, and I had their own library. And I've always loved libraries, and I'd sit there, and people are transcribed social histories. People are yeah, generally illiterate sailors, dockers, people like that. And I find that fascinating. You know, I just love people's stories. But the, the, we've still got the stories of Heavy the Eighth. And, you know, you see what I'm saying? There's the stories. Yeah, no, 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 so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more common. You know, and I'm sure a lot of history teachers do do this, but uh, quite often they're constrained by. Um, you know, quick exam specifications, but that sense of social history and the fact that um, that you can easily believe that all history is changed from above, rather than reality, which is much of history, or most of history is changed from below. But if you never hear about that, then you lose that sense of well, you could do that. You know, protest, for instance. And again, you go through 5,000 hours of education, do you learn about protest movements? I don't know. I don't know if they do or they don't, but my, my sense is that probably it's not something that's mentioned too much. No. Well, you know, I, I, th I think a lot of things are done by committee, and committees... I don't know. I've done it again, and it's good. Convert, I'm sorry, I don't know. You, you ask me when you want to ask me, go well, I, I, I identify with, with your instinct to, to create the social documents, the, the intellectual documents. And, and how I'm driven is to, to try and remind people, well, see this website, see this social practice. I'm, you know, I'm just a coordinator in all of this. this is, there, there's no magic powers. Mm. There's no magic heart. There's no special stick. <laughs> You, you know, I'm, I'm actually interested in means of education, which anybody can do anywhere, regardless of the resources there. Because not everybody can fill up a grant application. Mm. Mm. Uh, the third sector is an extension of 
the, the financial sector. Mm. These, these are pro highly problematic. Uh, well, tell me about it, because, oh. you know, I'm a director of the CIC Dramatic Recovery, which, you know, I'm a lay director, but they work very, very hard to try to get funding, lottery funding. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of time you've got to put into those things. Um, yeah, so I, I hear that. Yeah. We, we got uh, charitable uh, status, and I looked at it, and I, I saw the structuring effect of yeah. these bureaucracies. And then you, you decided to change it. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. And I thought, you know, to add value to the, 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 the set we're all finding ourselves, yeah. there needs to be a critical voice. So I just turned around and went, yeah. like, so it's the trustees, sorry guys, I, it's honestly... So, so, so I think in schools you can have both, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer, yeah, I'm a, this, I'm a great believer in schools having a really significant section of their curriculum being disciplinary, being, you know, taught knowledge, which is really important to learn in terms of you know, books and maps and science, but I, I would argue for... Surely, as a profession, we've got the space and expertise to have a section of the curriculum, which is very different. It's not students sitting in rows. It's students perhaps sitting in circles or small groups. It's not necessarily knowledge coming from the teacher. Perhaps it's generated, it's, it's community or socially generated knowledge. And I'm just saying some of the time for that. But what you've got a situation in some second schools, and there's no time allocated to that. Mm. I, I think we've got to almost create our own landscape, our own sociological habitat. And, and wouldn't it be great? And, and there are some, there are some organisations like um, the, uh, are doing this. There's an organisation called Rethinking Assessment, and hopefully they get some traction with the new government. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. All, all I think, yeah, not to put words in their mouth, but I would like to think that they would argue for some assessment to be based around non-writing, non-subjects, but a recognition. You know, if, if a student over 5,000 hours was able to build, or as part of 5,000 hours, a personal portfolio, which ended up helping them to realize their strengths and, mm -hmm. and well, that, that, where, well, where, what place they could place in, in a society, in the community, that would be great. But no, that doesn't exist at the moment. And there used to be something called National Record of Achievement, which was were known as the Burgundy Folders, really, where a student would have, um, effectively, they'd, they'd put their qualifications in there, but a personal statement. But surely in this digital age, we can have pupils scanning in examples of best work or things they're interested in, um, experiences that, you know, we used the phrase sparking, which you know comes from um, two other writers, um, you know that we did some work with. Um, but it's it, you know things where they've sparked an interest. But again, if you've gone through five thousand hours of secondary education and you're sitting there saying nothing sparked my interest, come on, yeah, <laughs> let's change what we're doing. You know, and, and and I think that's the argument we're trying to make. So if more kids can be sparked more of the time. Not Spartan in, in the comedy <laughs> sense of the word, then, then that's we're giving people more ideas for that, you know. Yeah, I, I, I was talking to a, a teacher yesterday, and I, I, I meet a woman, she really, really inspired lovers, and she was asking about whether I thought, you know, are, are people actually growing up? Too constricted, mm. too uh, too caged. So when it comes, because she found it, she she said, "Right, okay, you've got this dissertation. You can identify what you're going to write about. I'm here to help you mm. think, you know, think this through. I'm, mm. I'm here in a relationship." And she she's but kids aren't used to that. No, they're not used to that. And that's a problem. Yeah. Because it's I I see uh, it's it's a lot not just a loss of agency but it's a loss of apprehension. Well, you know, it, it, it comes. I mean, de, you know, Decky does a lot of writing around this, or Desi, however you pronounce him. But you know, if you have too much extrinsic motivation, you undermine one's intrinsic motivation, and it, it's finding mm. that spark again. It's finding that intrinsic that is. 
I feel for, for teachers because they, they, they do, in the vast majority of cases, yeah. brilliant work and they're frazzled and they rush off their feet and they're under-resourced. Most schools are in that situation because of underfunding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, schools should be should have much more funding. So Big Goddard, who wrote the forward to the book, is, is part of a, a collective of head teachers that I think is calling for an extra 10% of funding. Um, and that could do a lot. In fact, some schools are getting less and less money now per pupil for very different reasons. Thanks a lot. Yeah. But, but um, I still think it's a great job. I still think it, it lifts me when I work. I mean, I, I, I was doing some one-to-ones with students recently, and I often work with students in groups of about 25. And then perhaps every two or three months, I'll pull them to their like 10-minute one-to-ones as it goes up. And it's like inspirational. And you meet these kids and it's like, oh, it's just brilliant. <laughs> so I, I just really enjoy that. You know, I'm really lucky. Like, but what I've done, I guess, for a long time now, it's been an active disruptor. I've sort of said, look, I'm self-employed. I can come into your school. I can create this course. I can deliver this course. I can train your staff to deliver this course. But what I'm not going to do is, like, necessarily follow a <laughs> curriculum. I'm not going not gonna to be, it's not going to be an assessment at the end of it. Maybe there should be, but um, that's, I mean, that, that, that's really, it's an interesting thing though, isn't it? It's an interesting thing because, I mean, with 19, boy, what would it have been, 99, I think, I did a similar thing in a couple of secondary schools in Liverpool. I created this career portfolio thing. And so, like, students would build up a folder and they'd, they'd get evidence of work experience, mock interview, different things. And um, I was speaking at a conference. Before I was self-employed, I was a t- teacher. And this guy from the QCA spoke to me. The QCA is a curriculum's, curriculum qualification authority. Right. He was a lovely fella. And, he, and, and this sounds, um, I, I, I qualify that. He was a lovely fella. And he said to me, look, you know, uh, Andy, what, what you're doing is illegal. You can't really credit these kids because it's not a recognised qualification. It's not, quali- you're not recognised by the QCA. They're the, you know, every, every, exam board has to go to them and have it ratified. And I'm not saying it isn't, I'm not saying it is qualification, but these kids value it. If these kids haven't got, you know, they're two things short of getting it, what I'm finding these kids are motivated to get it because they're going to Liverpool University, they're getting a certificate presented, the parents are coming and they're getting a real buzz out of it. And that was, what, over 20 years ago, Alex. And I still feel like that, it, that, that sometimes the, 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 the the towel should wag the dog. Sometimes universities should be looking at schools and thinking, fuck, you know, that's great. You know what, can we, can we find a way of assessing this and crediting this rather than it being so top down? Yeah. Equally within the community. Well, well, and, and again, this goes back to living theory, isn't it? You know, you've got a guy so who's running a community centre, running the food bank, you know, a woman who's doing some amazing stuff in the community, a community garden. Wouldn't it be nice if the university come down and say, look, can, you, can we interview you and turn it into a, a degree? And then other people can learn from this. But they don't do that because it's sort of seen as fringe and it's not seen as being created by their staff. Well, so anyway, that's the way I think. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I think. And, and that's why self-employment suits me because I just find it hard to take all sorts of people. I repeatedly ask... <laughs> Why are you, have you heard of functional leadership? I've heard of it. I don't know okay. too much about it. It sounds like you, you, you're, you're more a functional leadership firm, you know, which is in a group, right? Uh, just so you can fool a rope around everybody. And if you're walking that way, well, the person on that side of the bundle has to leave because that's their, their, their sensory apparatus is going to inform the group. Yeah. It's going that way, you know, and, and it comes from a, a military back, you know, mm. background. But you know, you, you come to a, you know an impasse. Mm. You've got to build a bridge. Who's in charge? Well, I'm a radio guy. You, you need the engineer, you know, or she's there, you know. Yeah. So it, this idea of static hierarchy, it, it, it doesn't make sense in the real world. It, it, um, the best, the, the people who have de- demonstrated good leadership for me are the people who change their role and position. And the, it's, 
it kind of ends up a real joy amongst the group because yeah. they're not an ego. But, but a, a, a guy I'd love you to interview is, 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 is you know, great friend of mine, Tony McGuinness. So Tony McGuinness is a head teacher at school in Kirby. Um, mm -hmm. Kirby's on the outskirts of Liverpool. I don't even know the area, but it's, a, it, it's an area where, which has been known for a lot of deprivation, really. And he's just done a fantastic job. But he, you know, he won't mind me saying, I think, right, he doesn't mind me saying, you know, he's not a people pleaser. He'll, he'll, he's a, it's, you know, he'll make big, bold decisions. But he's the most down-to-earth fella you could ever meet. You know, he's lovely. He's from a working-class background. But, you know, he knows every member of staff's name in the school. He knows the cleaner's names. He knows... <laughs> and, and he takes an interest, you yeah, know? He takes an interest in, them, in their families. And, and some leaders just aren't like that. Some leaders won't give some people the time of day. Or, or value their opinion. So, yeah. Anyway, go on. You well, go ahead and get back. You know, the number of times, well, the, the, what's formed in my mind is one that, that so much knowledge and wisdom is held in the people. Yes. And for a society, for a human community to, to be healthy, happy, and, and creative and, and abundance, create abundance. That has to be recognised and valued where it is. Mm. And, and so I've, I've, I've been talking uh, over some years now about accreditation of prior learning and, and saying things like, Look, you come to the place I live. Now, mm. there's a guy on the 14th floor who can speak Latin. How? How? Yeah. How? Uh, there's, there's another guy who's written a tome on genetics because he keeps budgerigars. Yeah, because budgerigars want to breed a black budger. <laughs> and, and, and that piece of work others can learn from. And surely that should be what, you know, collective knowledge is about. You know? yeah. Not whether you've got the 9,250 quid to do, to, to, to do one year of study at a university. That's just the way it's become. And I've said to academics and administrators, you set the bar double time. Yeah. Tell me what I want to do just to show that mm -hmm. I can make some contribution, meaningful mm -hmm. contribution to the world, because I, I, I need this. Okay. If you can give an honorary diploma to Mugabe, <laughs> Maybe you yeah. should walk through the town and go, he, here's a first A local first hero. Join us. Well, maybe there's, maybe there's a bit of um, synergy here because if we want to write about and celebrate working class heroes and, and we both want them to be recognised more and perhaps there's some of that catching their knowledge that others can replicate, that could be something that... What? I'll put it into an email to you. Yeah, I think that'd be interesting. That that'd be sort of quite good. That, but but again, it's interesting because people often some really great people uh, get honorary degrees, don't they? Because you know they're seen as being it'd be good for that university to link to them, and, and the university recognises it. But we good if some got an honorary degree. who was you know running the community allotment for the last twenty years. Do you know what I mean? I, I just don't think enough of that happens. It's always the people in the public eye that seem to get these things. I mean, yeah. David, well, I mean, David Beckham gets on ceremonial it. Because David Beckham needs, oh my God, you know, <laughs> he's got everything. Can we give it to someone who hasn't got everything? Yeah, okay. Me, me, or, or people who, you know, the, the idea that... And, and, and could inspire other people, and then perhaps then someone can write a bit about them and put it into a format that other people might say, do you know what, that person, could, could, could that person be replicated to that man? The soup, the soup movements are interested in um, the, the Liverpool, Liverpool soup. So there's um, around the country, uh, the are what called soup movements. So Liverpool soup is an organisation um, that uh, every three or four months they meet, community groups pitch for five minutes, and people, they, they, the money that's raised on the night between sessions are given to the winning pitch. And... and uh, all around the country, there are different soups. I think it started in Philadelphia, the movement. Right. It's a fantastic evening. You know, I've been to a few in Liverpool. You get 100 people there. You might have 1,500 quid for people pitching about, um, like I say, doing stuff in community gardens or uh, setting up this boxing group or whatever. It's brilliant. And it's just the spirit of it is fantastic. But it's like, wouldn't it be nice if... Um, 
you know, there's more of that. And wouldn't it nice if universities did something and companies did something that was a bit more recognising people uh, 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 who do that grassroots stuff. Not that they need to be recognised because they're doing it out of love a lot of the time, but it just makes their life a little bit easier and there's a few more pop in the bank account. And, you know, and it's, it's a nice feeling as well for, <laughs> for those people to be recognised. You know. Yeah. I always, I always feel that with teachers. Contribute yeah. to, yeah. The, you know, unique contributions to right knowledge. Yeah. Like where there was a, 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 a woman who studied her back garden and found 39 new species. You know, yeah. and yeah, there are people, I love the story of John Harrison, yes. who came up with the, 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 the way that chicks can yeah. navigate. And well, again, it'd be great to brainstorm with you about some of these people that have, you know, inventors, creators, um, creatives who have come, not got any formal education whatsoever. I mean, the other thing, I don't know if you read that section of the book about autodidacts, because again, it's only a small section of the book, but I'd like to think that schools spend a bit of time, I mean, even if it's just an assembly, even just an assembly for 15 minutes and just say to kids, you know what, there's, there's people that are really, really successful, that really change the world, and they've got no formal education. In fact, some of them were illiterate, and they've done it. And this is what's driven them, and this is the impact of... And I wonder if, as you're sitting there thinking, there's something that you'd want to do. This perhaps we don't cover, and perhaps you'd like to go a bit deeper into it. Just, I just think that's really interesting. And it's like, again, it's a less of a top-down thing. It's more of a needs-driven thing then, you know? And, I, and you know, people listening to this might think that's a bit unrealistic. But actually, even if it's an after-school club, you know, even, even if it's like um, a, 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 a group of kids who get taken off time table for a week and they get the opportunity to do X, and then they write about it. But there's no flexibility to do it at the moment because they, oh, they might take away from their, their curriculum and they might, you know, that's going to affect their exams. And they think, yeah, but it can really affect what they do after school. It can affect their the way they feel about themselves. Does that make sense? And, and that's all I'm arguing for, really, you know, so. I know, there's, there's, there's humanity running through what you're doing. And we, if we don't move out of this machine way of doing things, we're going to break more people. Here's, here's an analogy I use. Uh, uh, Right. Imagine picking a national football team by going, okay, here's, here's the land mass. I'm going to draw a square mile here and take all the players from there. Mm. Wait, wait, wait. What kind of, you know, that, that's not, if it's a national football team, maybe you want to open it up to everybody. Yeah. And I think there's an old Greek phrase, a society really, uh, Really goes great. And in that when square you, mile, is it is it is it, is it Eton in Windsor? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Or the square mile, but yeah. But yeah, I get what you say. And, and it's, it, it's, it's easy to be successful. And among, and most, people, can... most people want this. And I think, I don't, I don't necessarily know the answer. I guess from where I am, I've got no real power. So my, my influence is, well, I, I'll, I'll model that by the work I do in schools and I'll try and write about it and hopefully people read the book and try and add some of your ideas. But, yeah. I do, but I do think you need more people to be less differential. I think you need more people to be more entrepreneurial and, and, and also more people to, to challenge the status quo. Yeah. And, and one of the things that happened to me, um, which is a really good thing as a teacher, and I guess I've been teaching nine years at this point and there was an opportunity to disapply some kids from the curriculum so what disapplication meant was you can take um i think it was initially 15 kids on each half of the year group in year 10 so that'd be 15 14 15 years old off of timetable and do something different with them that's oh, been school yeah. And I, st I set up this course called a uh, life skills course and I did two hours a week. And then I think it became four hours a week. 
and it ended up with a really interesting timetable. So the timetable where I was teaching A level and teaching this, so I was teaching kids, intellectually speaking, say, at the top end of the school, and then walking across and then teaching these other kids. And I started enjoying that more. I started enjoying that more because, you know, and, and what I started to realise is, if I wasn't there to teach an A-level class, I could just get another A-level teacher. But this, this course has been set up from scratch. No one else could do that. And, and no one else could put that content into it. And, and actually, again, it was another non-accredited course. But, was, but, but the course was keeping some kids in school. The course was, was helping some kids. I mean, I, you know, we built some qualifications into it. They weren't, um, I think, carrying any sort of GCSE, but they, you know, so, you know, they got the first aid certificates. There was some hygiene certificates, things like that. You do a bit of food stuff, registered, you put it to life skills, you know. But it was, you know, I also taught them how to mind map. I taught them how to sort of have a debate. And it was just really interesting. It was just, and it was like, I thought, I just want more of this. I, well, I don't want to te keep teaching to a syllabus, teaching to an exam. I've got nothing against that, but I've done, I've done quite a few. I, I did that for 12 years. And then in the end, I just like wanted to do more of that. So what's nice now, after years and years of being out there doing teacher training and around the country conferences and whatnot, uh, coaching hundreds of teachers, which I've loved. It's really nice to be in a space now where I still do a bit of that, but I mostly help schools to just try and create a bit more innovative curriculum. It's, uh, it's really interesting how you've driven away from the, the media neurosis of the, of the country, which is quantity interventions, scale, you know, let's do something big scale to... Well, towards, I, I would like to scale some of these things up. I guess, you know, I sort of said before that some of the things that, like, for instance, the Scholars Programme, I've only got it running in three schools at present. I'd love it to be running in 100 schools. But what I can't do is be in those 100 places, but I'd love the opportunity to... To, to, to get people to go out and to make their own version of these things. And, and there are, you know, universities have um, yes, wide participation so You're starting from quality. So that, that's what I, that's well, I always, do, I always do that. I yeah. do a pilot, then I do a couple of other versions of it, iterations, then I put it out there, and then I grow it. I don't grow it without going through those stages. And you, you're always tweaking it, changing it, and adding more modules and dimensions to it. Um, but that's, I guess, how I see it. You know, that's how I see putting together training tools. I, I create training products and I want them to work. So therefore you have to sort of think, even if it's just like a two hour session, what, how will that two hour session really resonate with that group of people? Yeah. Well, it's been interesting throwing open the doors and going, you, you create the curriculum. Anybody can do a talk, come and talk about what you're passionate about. How do you want the room? I'm the janitor. You know, I facilitate that space. Yeah. And the number of people from education and who have retired from education who've said, you know, this kind of blank space, this open space, mm. what the university used to be mm. like, this is what education should be. And every, every bit of that space now is filled with something where you have to measure. Well, I can't. And, and after I come with every bit of it. And all I'm saying, and it's like you're saying the same thing about academia, I'm saying it in schools, is let's, let's, let's ease up a little bit and create some space. Now, I can understand why there's some reticence from the powers of be because sometimes there's been some uh, pedagogical experiments of things like, um, there was a thing called opening minds a few years ago, inquiring minds, things like that. And really, I don't think students got too much out of it, right? But it is, it is about the quality, and it is, you know, if I was a head teacher of a school, I wouldn't let someone in from the outside to speak to my students unless I knew they're really good. Yeah. But, you know, let's give, you know, and, and, and all schools open their door to, to people coming in. But I'd love to think that there's a bit more work done on the quality of those externals coming in. But also, yeah. and there's some brilliant, really interesting people out doing all sorts of stuff, you know, ranging from knife crime to going to university or whatever, and they're really, really interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about not so much talks, it's, it's, 
if students doing a course going through like a journey. Yeah. And I, I think so, I think the training course can change a lot. You know, I think I think the training course for adults too. Um, and I just think how you design those things. I'm, I'm fascinated to learn about courses that people go on to help them with addiction or help them with depression. I'm fascinated about the dynamics of those courses and what makes them work and what makes it work for one person might, might not make it work for someone else. But someone out there is trying to create something to make a human being's life better. And as I'm saying, I think, you know, we've, we've got to take some of that and, and do more of it in, in school, Jim. Well, it's totally uh, inspiring to, to meet you and hear and, and see the passion that, that's in this writing, in this book. And, uh, well, thanks, Alex. It's been nice to meet you. And as I say, anything and I can we can do. collaborate, you know, in the future. I mean, as again, you know, just getting more... So, you know, I, I don't know what's next. It's, when you do a book, it's a little bit like Steve Redgrave. Don't don't let me shoot me for going a boat again. You know, <laughs> um, but but yeah, you, you get to a point where you sort of think, you know, I'll probably go and have a, a pint with Matt and just say to him, you know, what do, what do we want? It's generally our best decisions are made over a pint. You know, as you, as you said yourself. It's, yeah, we, yeah, we go in uh, and yeah. like formal meetings and then yeah. we retire. But I've got a nice, I've got a real affinity with him. I really like him, and he's been really easy to work with. And in his own way, he's he's very, very well, he's a very bright guy, but he's very bright on like the literacy side of things, and he's um, and he and he's very very passionate about um, how to help kids from poorer backgrounds. Um, and yeah, we just do, and we you know, so it'd be it'd be interesting to do something else, but uh, and. Yeah, and you're saying that because you do a bit of work with some of the um, is it working class academics as well, Peter Shuki and I, yeah, well, I sent a few know. things to some of them. Thanks for what some of the things you sent by the way as well, because you know there's a few people sent back some really really good ideas that have, that have helped to find a way into the book. So you know, um, again, yeah, I'm the sort of person that who like I've really enjoyed meeting you today. And it's like, I'd love to meet you again. And I've come up to Scotland or whatever, you know, but that's all. But like, if I go somewhere, I don't feel not so much comfortable, but it's like, I, I just won't bother a second time, you know what I mean? It's good. There's got to be a report. At last two short, you know what I mean? There's got to be, you've got to get that instance. Of, it's like that with Matt. It's like, yeah, the punch, you know what? I could work this guy. And it's like, you know, I, I get that from yourself. You're not got a big ego. You're just like, Trying something else. Let's, yeah, let's try and do something. Are you, something you, are you not thinking, oh, well, how can you use this guy to make money? You know? <laughs> and that's, you meet a lot of people like that. How can that people, person make me look good? It's, you meet a lot of people like that. So I, I just, it's like a cognitive and I mean, I'm, I'm getting too old. So I mean, <laughs> not at the end, but like, you know, my career will be, um, I'll keep going as long as I want to type of thing, but I'm sort of like dropping a day a week from, um, from next September just because I've, I've got. I just want to, and I just feel I'm getting a bit more. I think it would, it, think it would, it would be beneficial for the quality of my work. And so dropping a day a week means that I keep the same quality, the same energy when I'm working with teachers and leaders and kids, and I get a little bit more time for myself. And as you get older, you just feel like you need that. Just, I'm, in, I'm in my late 50s now, I feel like I need that. But um, as I was um, on the train before, I was sort of thinking, what would be new for me? So I think it'd be nice to do something collaborative. And one of the things that I think has come out of this conversation for me is like, you know, you found a, a university that went and found you and recognised you. And maybe we can find more people in those sort of institutions to say, look, can you go and recognise some of these people here? I don't need more recognition. But there's a few people here who by doing that, not only would it be a great fillet for them and their community, yeah. and the recognition that happens at the moment, unfortunately, tends to be the honour system. So if someone, if someone offered me an OB, I would, I would turn it down straight away. Right? Yeah. And, and I, right, totally right. Get, I totally get the fact, for very good reasons, that people accept them. And I've got a few friends who've got honours, and it, 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 no disrespect to them, it's just not for me, because I think it would fly against a lot of the things that I stand for. And... Yeah. Yeah. But, but it is a way that often 
people get recognised. So if you take like the post office inquiry, you know, um, giving the knighthood to, um, uh, you know, the chap Alan, yeah. you know, is great. And, and all the post off, postmasters are delighted by it. But can we have some recognition that's non based on the honour system? Please. And actually, if we've got, if you've got someone who, like, bit, you know, no disrespect, but a bit like yourself, who's like, you know what, I've got no real uh, qualifications background. I didn't really do well at school, but do you know what? You built something here, or you, and then someone's come and said, wouldn't it be lovely if you got, you know, to, to walk up and receive something? I just think that would more universities do it. And if, if, you, if you can come back to me with a way that me and you could speak to, Twenty of those people on Zoom or whatever, or even me in person, I'd be really interested in that. Well, I, after realizing charitable route, the, 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 that one route wasn't the way to go, I've been spending years, a couple of years, particularly with COVID, really deeply thinking about it. What's happened over here? What have I learned how do you, from how do, you, people? how do you make a living, Alex? You don't let me ask you. What do you do for like? I live off some fresh air, man. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I don't. I'm desperate. Like, I, I'll send you the essay. Something about COVID. Do you do some sort of don't you like websites or something like that? Yeah, no, I, I really thought. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I just saw a, a, a guy. Uh, Brought me down south, said, I like what you're doing. Yeah. You can talk to community. I will build your website. I will teach you how to build websites. Yeah. Uh, if, if that belongs to the community and you pass on what you know. I said, Anthony, Anthony Ellis, lovely guy. Um, yeah. And I thought, this is my opportunity because I can make something functional that's yeah. a dollar value in the world. Yeah. And, and hopefully get uh, get established. Now, mm. what's been interesting is running into the invisible walls. Like, uh, there's one uh, great, fantastic uh, professor I worked with, uh, and they said, I want you to build my website. Mm. And I said, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then and the wow. university stepped in and went, Sorry, your, 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 your website's not secure. It's really, it's really interesting because I'm doing a bit of work in a few weeks' time at Keel Uni, and I've got a contract. Just, it's just a one-day thing for training some of their wide participation staff, okay? And the guy who has got me the gig is a great fella. Um, but again, he, he makes decisions and they're like overruled by you know, 